Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. I'm Jamie Heller. I'm the business editor of the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for having me here. We're talking about the space economy today. And we have, I think, a pretty star-studded panelist on the topic here that I'll introduce. Uh, Javier Battelle. Yeah. Prime Minister of Luxembourg. Richard Ambrose runs uh, the space project, uh, the space business at Lockheed Martin. Jan Yadigaroglu uh, is an investor in the sector. And at the end here, we have Jeff Tarr, who's an entrepreneur in the sector, ran Digital Globe, which was recently taken over by Maxoff. Uh, so before we begin, I wanted to just ask this group, which is a very nice small group, if we were going to say beginner, intermediate, or advanced on the subject, if you could just put yourself in a category so we could say, get a sense of what people know. So how many would say they're beginners? Okay, so we have some beginners. Intermediates? Okay, some people know. And advanced? Oh, so we have some good experts here. Okay, so it's a, it's a small group. So we'll we'll be talking with the panelists, but we'll be just talking amongst each other to um, figure out really what's new and exciting and where the promise and the hype is in in this sector, in this in this growing sector. So the the big broad question that WEF asked me to um, pose is I'm just going to re read this out so we get a sense of the breath here. Um, from the ubiquitous internet access to precise climate monitoring and affordable space tourism, a new golden age of space economy led by the commercial sector is upon us. How can investors, companies, and governments leverage the estimated one trillion, and we're debating whether what's the back to that number, um, including to benefit society? So we're talking about making money, talking about businesses, we're talking about social benefits all together here, and and how close are we, and, and what are the challenges ahead? So um, can we just start with a question of, you, we're all talking about how exciting this feels right now. Um, Richard, what has changed to make this feel like the hot topic right now? Well, I think there's a tremendous uh, amount of uh, vitality now in the whole space segment. M most elements are under some kind of you know, growth or transformative uh, uh, pressure of some kind because of opportunities. Uh, technology has improved. Uh, the interconnected is, has improved in space. Some of the uh, costs are coming down, both for satellites and or uh, launch uh, capabilities uh, at a fairly uh, high rate. Um, we kind of track this. Uh, so we've we counted 975 new space entrants, not counting the, you know, uh, companies like a Blue Origin or SpaceX. That's the kind of excitement, and again, they're getting venture money in this segment. Okay, and Jan, how are we, like, if you think about the internet and how that took off, but then there was a bubble, but then uh, obviously within the bubble, a lot lasted. Where, how would you compare space, space economy to that boom? Like, where are we in the cycle? Okay, well, uh, so uh, I, as you know, I do venture capital, and my attention span on this started a little over 10 years ago when we invested in SpaceX. So just speaking from that period and maybe the next 10 years, um, that's an in, this is an industry where launch costs uh, are going to go through something like a hundredfold decrease in cost and therefore in accessibility. Uh, the performance and cost of the sensors, platforms, satellites, things that we're putting in space is going through a similar kind of uh, leverage. And certainly in low Earth orbit, we're also getting the benefits of uh, big computation and machine learning. That combination is, is pretty dramatic and, and, and competitive with other very large disruptive events occurring in other sectors. So I think it has all the hallmarks of uh, a big disruptive phenomenon that uh, we've seen in other industries. And space so far has not been certainly the largest industry on the planet. You know, lift on its own is less than 10 billion a year, for instance. Uh, but uh, but it's, a, it's a sizable industry going through really, really big uh, secular change. Big dramatic effects. And frankly, uh, if I may, 
it's, it's uh, maybe like the movie business, which as you know is a tiny industry that everyone, that impacts everybody because we all have the, the emotion and the interest in it. I, I think humanity is uh, very interested in, in this industry uh, for reasons that are not just uh, commercial. Right, and Jeff, where do you see it on the spectrum of like, where are we in the cycle of this, of this industry? Well, well, the space industry has been around for a very long time. Uh, there is a lot of change right now. Uh, and I think with that change is both promise and there's peril as well. The, the promise is the technology is really exciting. And some of the changes that Eon and uh, Richard have talked about are really important changes both in space and on the ground. But I also believe the technology is a source of peril. And your comment on the movie industry is a relevant one. Because when money flows into an industry, for reasons other than economic benefit uh, and even societal benefit, and, and the movie industry is one of those, you can attract too much capital that ultimately doesn't deliver a return. And that can be problematic. But that aside, I think the opportunity is huge. The benefits for humanity are huge. The opportunity for smart investors to make money uh, is very significant as well. Javier, what is your, like, your country stands out for space of interest in it. What is, what is the, what's compelling about it for Luxembourg? Uh, it's the fact that my country is much bigger in space than on the ground. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a reality, but that's also part of my history. I, uh, in the 80s, for example, um, my country wanted to be active in the satellites industry. And um, at that moment, a lot of uh, countries said, no, it's not possible, it's, uh, it won't fit. We were even not able to find an insurance company to, in, to put an insurance on the satellites. That's the reality. And then uh, we decided in the 80s that we would uh, invest public money for the insurances and being the, gar the guarantor of this. And if I'm very honest, this was a big part of the budget if there would have been a problem. So it was a political decision. And um, now uh, Société Européenne de Satellite SES is one of the biggest satellite company in the world. So uh, it is a public-private um, partnership who make it possible. And I still believe that nowadays we have to do it on this space. It's not a public, it's not a private, it's something we need to do you know, also uh, together. So uh, I realized that when we decided to be active in Space mining. Um, I feel as a prime minister, I think the same that the prime minister was considered in the 80s to visit a shrink. <laughs> but it's the fact that in politics, sometimes you, you need to, if you want to be part of the next big thing, you need sometimes to, to take decisions, even if people in your own country you need to explain and they can't touch it because it is, if you speak about space, a lot of, and I'm very proud that we are now in a bigger room than last year. Last year we had an audience of five persons. Now already we <laughs> are 20 of hot, yeah. 50, maybe next year will be 200. Okay. So we see that the interest is growing too. Yeah. And I'm sure it will be also with the countries. When we started, we, a few countries uh, wanted to join and we have uh, all the time more countries who wants to participate to this uh, initiative and to be part of this next big, uh, big thing. It is just difficult to explain it to my taxpayer. It, but is, it remains difficult. It remains difficult, but I want them to be part of it, and especially as a country. I'm very honest with you, and I'm, I'm sorry, I will be short, but no, take um, the fact is my country was a poor country. My country was a farmer's country. And then we discovered steel. And we were very successful with steel, and this makes the, the, my, my country rich. And then realize that this won't be forever, so we start to be active in finances. We start to be active in, in telecommunications. If I realize, for example, RTL is in Europe one of the biggest media group. And uh, even when Europe was separated in two, through Luxembourg, RTL, it was the, the news of freedom for people living on the other side of the Berlin Wall. The Beatles were the first played also on RTL, so a bit part of, uh, of Luxembourg. And this was also public decision to support private broadcasting by giving broadband. And then we started again to do funds. We, uh, we are now behind the United States, the second biggest industry in funds. And then the satellites. 
and then now the, the space mining. So it is so important always to be proud about your history and about your past, but also being ready to say, this might be not popular, but this might be how my country will continue to be as wealthy as it is. And I did the same comparison with the ruler of Dubai. I told him that he was uh, also a uh, poor country and uh, we had green and grass and then steel and then banks and then finances and then uh, et cetera, et cetera. He said, I told him he had sand and he discovered then gas and petrol, then they did tourism and finances and now they are very successful. And so we came both- they go space next? Um, or you got that? Um, 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 this, it's, I'm not the official uh, spokesman yeah. of Dubai. But um, <laughs> the fact is, that together realized that we were poor farmers, even if they were with camels and we had cows, but now we are successful businessmen. So let's talk about the United States government for a second, because just coincidentally, I was at the Kennedy Space Center last month, and I don't know how many of you visited it in Florida, but I, I was on the verge of tears for most of the visit. It's so emotional the way the country wrapped its energy around um, the space program decades ago. But where are we now? How, how happy you are, are you with where the US government and NASA are in terms of their efforts? Is it, is it the right amount, not enough, too much? Could you address that? Because it's obviously the commercial sector is taking off. How important is the government, and are they doing enough? Well, well I, I make a quick comment is the US government is more than NASA. NASA is really important. And we have the, the uh, former chief scientist of NASA right here in the room, too. Who's Massively that? important. It's, it's Alan, I can see that, that on the shoes yeah. right there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. But, but we have to yeah, yeah. we have to keep in mind that the space industry is more than uh, NASA. Uh, that there are many U.S. government customers of space. Pentagon. Uh, uh, Pentagon being one. Uh, the, the space helps keep the nation safe uh, and other and our allies safe. It helps uh, protect the environment. It supports first responders, whether domestically or abroad. Uh, and that all generates both you know, real dollars for the industry because there's a real need, and it drives innovation for the industry that then serves commercial markets. Uh, yeah. So I'm a big yeah. supporter of what they're doing. Yeah, so yeah, I bring it back to your question earlier, uh, discussion of the internet. If you look at its history, the, the government's invested in that built out that infrastructure, took on all that risk, right? But then they turned it over to the public. And once it went to the public, the power of the innovation, entrepreneurialism took off. And I mean, no one will question the, the magnitude of that. I think it's the same thing here between uh, the US government and all governments that participate. They're burning off risk, and that's what governments right, do, right. right? Because it is risky. Space is still a harsh place. <laughs> um, uh, to go, uh, but as they burn down that risk, and I wouldn't say all the risk is, uh, is uh, diluted, but as you do it, now it opens up. So these entrepreneurs now can come out. So we understand, we've trained, we know how to get to space. NASA shares data. When they do a program, for instance, the Orion Space Capsule with us, and we do a test, so let's say parachute technology, that's shared with all the other uh, entrants and uh, commercial entities. So they have a big role. I think they'll always have a, a role, but it's not either or, I think it'll be both as, as the commercial emerges. Anything on that? Yeah, this is a bit of a minefield here, so. I'll, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I've done, uh, out in space and out, uh, we've, we've done several dozen um, venture investments over the last 15 years, all of them entirely intimately tied with government, uh, my own education, uh, my, uh, my PhD in physics was part NASA funded. I mean, of course, everything we do is intimately tied with uh, the U.S. government's commitment and other governments' commitment to science, <laughs> development, uh, education, everything else. Specifically, uh, NASA had some real genius moves in allowing this uh, new crop of private companies to enter into space, both on the lift and in terms of the satellites and applications. Mm -hmm. It's also a microcosm where you see all the evil effects of government and, uh, and how sometimes it gets politicized or used as jobs programs or uh, you know, there's inertia in the system. So I think you, you, you have all of that. Look, these are, these are well-publicized issues. And- uh, We've got and, some and, beginners in the room. But look, we, we've had, uh, space has not just been viewed as um, important for the country or for business. It's also been a strategic interest for the country militarily, in terms of national security, many other things. And so all that gets wrapped into to that, right? And so 
uh, certainly, I think certain programs have been maintained for the wrong reasons. All the money isn't all well spent. Um, but look, by and large, uh, clearly the, the role of government has been absolutely fundamental all this and continues to be fundamental. Let's talk about the customers. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about all the amazing things that all this effort can do for humanity. Can you elucidate who the actual end customers are? Like, what kind of small, medium, and large size businesses, governments, academic, academic institutions, like, who is paying for this? It, uh, it depends on what sector of the space economy, what segment. Uh, you know, I can talk to one, which is Earth Observation, which isn't the largest. Uh, we're all customers of the telecommunications segment of, of the space industry. Uh, when it comes to Earth observation, uh, governments are certainly large customers, the largest customers. Uh, they have a huge need to keep nations safe and to, to map, provide for safety of navigation, uh, et cetera. Uh, but Google, uh, Apple, for, for Digital Globe, for example, Google, Apple, Microsoft, here, uh, you know, in your car when you're navigating, that's all fueled by Digital Globe. Uh, then there is a whole set of humanitarian organizations from, you know, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to the World Bank, uh, oil companies and mining companies looking for resources. Uh, we've got a, a large number of early stage companies, uh, you know, Jimmy Crawford's company, Orbital Insight, which I think a lot of people have heard of, is one of those, uh, doing really significant work helping uh, financial services institutions and NGOs. So there's a large number of customers and it is growing and it's growing with the benefit of investments from or, you know, VCs like uh, Ian here. Yeah. yeah, another, if I could jump in just to pick up, but take GPS. Uh, United States Air Force back in the 70s developed a GPS program for military use. But over the years that's been expanded. Other countries are now flying uh, position navigation timing systems. And everyone in this room, everyone who's going to watch this video uses that. Mm -hmm. And you're also a buyer of other products. So how are we using that? Is that like so, the Find Friends app or what? Like uh, what is, how are whatever. We well, if, uh, if, if you're trying to find a meeting room somewhere around Davos mm -hmm. and you typed in <laughs> the location, <laughs> yeah. uh, you're using it. So can now, you if it gets you lost... It's not the satellite signal, it's the mapping software. So I have clarity. <laughs> Can you explain, like, I mean, f for so many of us, our lives are already so much better than we were kids in terms of, like, traffic or communications or finding people. What, what is the next level of sophistication that we're going for here? What is going to be, help, help us understand what, what we're going for that we don't have now. If, uh, just... A practical thing also, because you spoke about GPS and all these modern things, we should never forget true research for the space. It benefits for everyday life since history. If you cooked your eggs this morning with a teflon pan, teflon was used for space industry at the beginning. Now it is in every kitchen. Right. And so every the progress of all these things, truly research for the space, helps in everyday life uh, too. If I would tell you what will be the next big thing tomorrow, I wouldn't sit here. I would, uh, being uh, producing that, no, I would sit there. Yeah, <laughs> sit there. Exactly. <laughs> I, would sit, I would sit there. So, um, but uh, for me, what is very important also you. when you, when you, I, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we speak about business afterwards, but yeah. the, the fact is, um, you said also, and this is for me what is so important, that you have here on stage, public and private. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to do it by myself. Mm -hmm. And they need the public authorities too. So it is so important really to work together and, it's, and we are not enemies. And so if the state decided to, a state decide to organize something, it's not, it should never be again the private sector. Because if we start to be one against the other, this will be blocking, I think, the, um, the fast evolution that we have for the moment. So it is a joint venture that we need to have between private and public sector. And this is why we took this initiative to guarantee to private investors also the the security they need to invest also uh, this money in those, in those topics. That's the reason why we decided to do that. So, so I think I can answer partly both questions you asked uh, in this way. Um, and actually, let me just start with an example. Uh, you know, Uber is a seven-year-old company because iPhone 3 got a GPS chip in it. So yes, Travis and the whole entrepreneurs were incredibly important, but that Uber would be created in seven years ago was preordained 
incidentally, the GPS chip was put in not because Apple thought that that was the most important piece of silicon to put in, but because they had to comply with 911 laws. Mm -hmm. And it was cheaper to do that than to upgrade the triangulation algorithms for the whole network. So again. But by the way, yes. we had an article that Uber can find you better than 911 still right now. Still. So. So, but so, so sometimes it's, it's uh, the way things happen is counterintuitive. Um, we, we seed funded Planet uh, six years ago, I want to say. Uh, the three guys used to work for the NASA administrator, Pete Warden, the NASA Ames administrator, who's obviously been a, a genius and a leading force in a lot of things. And uh, if you think of Planet as a new entrant in what Digital Globe has been uh, a major uh, force in, Again, it was preordained that that would happen six years ago because the scanning aspect of monitoring Earth from space is relatively easy in the sense that an orbit, a satellite's orbiting every 90 minutes, so it's moving really fast. The problem is, how do, what do you do with that fire hose of data? Uh, the 100 planet satellites that they collect 40 terabytes a day. So you need to have you need to have a way to beam that down. So you had to invent cheap, low-cost X-band modems. But more importantly, you needed Amazon uh, uh, AWS and Google Cloud to put that data someplace and compute it. And you needed the machine learning type algorithms to deal with it. So if, at its simplest, you can think of Planet as sitting in a wedge that's forming. The world is, of course, increasingly valuing real-time, continuous, accurate uh, data and monitoring about everything that's going on in the world, right? Planet sees every single tree in the world every day sees every ship in the world, sees every parking lot and how many people are in it. And, all, and then making that through these sort of machine learning techniques, useful information, that, that's the value of that's growing. And then the cost of it, which is the lift costs in the space, uh, the transmission cost of transmitting tens and tens of terabytes, soon hundreds of terabytes down, and then the machine learning algorithms to make it useful that is decreasing in a compounding way. There's two Moore's laws at work there. So, so I think if you take a step back, and usually it helps to have the benefit of time, you, you can very much predict what is the next most important thing, the next thing that's going to happen, and why, and how it's relevant. And so I don't think there's a lot of mystery when you say, what is the business model, effectively? Uh, I, could, I could lay out a whole bunch of business models that are happening now, and they're happening for those very deep reasons, right? Can it's you not just that give us one or two just to bring into life. Well, okay, so so why don't we break it up? Uh, I'm doing this, you know, uh, here off the fly, but uh, let's think about space as very near Earth, which, as you know, is becoming much more today uh, driven by these constellations of satellites, very inexpensive, uh, that therefore can do continuous, complete coverage all the time, and it's not just imaging, right? All kinds of things including telecom, but also other kinds of imaging. Um, and uh, then you have the, the, the traditional big market, the GTO market, the geostationary market. That is probably uh, you know, diminishing. That's not a growing business model. And then you have the sort of whole deep space that's opening up today for the first time. To think about the one that's most successful because it's closest, uh, if you look at near space, I mean, certainly the planet models are, and uh, all their competitors are, are pretty obvious. Uh, so, just so I don't take, uh, you know, if you're an insurance company or you're an ag company, or let's say you're working just to take a softer problem on smallholder agriculture in uh, Tanzania. Well, if you want to do a randomized controlled trial of what does it mean to give people better fertilizer in the past, you had to have a huge field for us and go look at every field. Well, today you're seeing every single day, you're seeing those plants grow, and you know exactly what's going on. So you can build a... Uh, a objective analytical framework. And you can do that for the whole globe at the same time with one data pipeline and get to that answer much more effectively. And of course ag is important. Of course forestry is important. Of course global transportation, logistics, port operations, retail operations, real estate. I mean all those things are really, right. really big businesses, right? These are not small industries and they're all being affected by those new analytics coming from space. No, I couldn't agree more that some of the most exciting innovations are taking place on the ground. Uh, and things that weren't possible a few years ago to do are now possible with cloud computing and deep learning. Um, just to bring some of these metrics to life, uh, the database at the company that I led until recently uh, was 100 petabytes. That, that's the equivalent of 100 million 
hours of video. And the pace at which we were generating data uh, at about 100 terabytes a day would have taken tens of thousands of analysts to actually review it all, if, they even, if we even tried. So now with what's available to us in the cloud, and AWS is one example and there are others, we can now analyze that data in ways that weren't possible. And so instead of helping one smallholder farmer in Tanzania, we can help smallholder farmers all across Africa working with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation because they can tap into a massive database. We can fight cholera with the World Bank in ways that weren't possible before, and we can actually make progress on thwarting human trafficking, uh, which you know, recently won a Pulitzer Prize from uh, a group of, uh, of reporters uh, uh, for public service. So there's a lot that can be done, a lot of industrial applications, and I think we're just getting started. I think there are other, I believe there are other technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. There it is. That are going to, you have to say it here, it's the real economic are. Form, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said multi-stakeholder okay. yet. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, there are other technologies, the Internet of Things, but think also about virtual reality and augmented reality. I, I believe that with this data and the compute, the ability to view and analyze data in context as well as creating some amazing experiences <laughs> is, a, is starting to become possible. And I, it's just the beginning. Yeah, so it's, it's what you're harvesting and then how you're able to use it. Yeah. Two things coming together. Yes, yeah, so if I can build on Jeff, you know, I'll give you a different number, but if you think of satellite as a sensor, the, you know, we would use a number as about 330 billion of the industry in 2016 yeah, I think you had a number 350 of current state, but probably about 60 to 70 percent of that is in the ground, and all this processing because you're getting derived value. Mm -hmm. That's why you'll hear us sometimes say you go to space through the ground because you have to build that infrastructure, and then you get into you know, either uh, we've been talking about weather and some of micro forecasting, uh, even just mentioning uh, micro farming and things that are going on with all that technology. So it, it's growing. Uh, used to be double digit. We'd probably say it's eight or nine percent. We'd also say back in probably uh, 2015 or so, there are probably 40 some countries. You mentioned right now we think there's 70 countries involved at some level of space, and, and we think that'll be 80 or 90 here uh, by 2024. So, I mean, not to be cynical, but just to put it out there, this stuff has got to be pretty expensive to use. Like. Um, is this, for a while, is this going to mostly be um, the, to the benefit of hedge funds that are going to be able to like get an edge and quants and it sounds like this is like quant heaven, right? You're talking hedge about the analytics? Heaven. Well, uh, all together, I, I, like all what you're saying is like that you can know what's going on with climate or know what's going on with the parking lots. Like that seems to be a, a, a definite customer. Is well, it, it is a customer. Yeah. They are customers. The large companies are customers, but also there's an ecosystem of developers. Uh, there are thousands of developers who are now writing deep learning and artificial intelligence applica <laughs> based applications that are running on space generated data right. and answering questions for companies large and small, NGOs large and small. And, and so I don't think this is just the domain of right. Of I'm the just large saying it's, it's this expensive stuff, and you've got to imagine that it's going to give like one of the. There's been a lot of like great things talked about of what's gonna, this going to bring to society, but it's also going to make some very very smart investors give them an edge in the market. That's if I can answer so. that. So um, look, you're not wrong. It does all cost money, and I, I could touch at some point on what I was saying, which is you're seeing these sort of hundredfold decreases in costs, so, but let's put that aside. It does today still cost money, and especially the computation uh, problem of, of all that costs a lot of money. If you, saw, if you see, and I'll come back to Planet, uh, uh, because it's a company I know well, obviously. The good news is that the commercial applications are so important that they recognize that they could and therefore should make this data available for non-commercial applications. And uh, in essence, coincident with the creation of the commercial company, they created something called planet.org. 
which gives you access to the same world-class analytics comprehensive for the globe for non-commercial applications. They have something like 100 partners. So to give you an example, if you were working on Amazon deforestation, a big chunk of your budget was, which you're begging for from foundations, is to buy some satellite imagery. Right. And then you would get the images and you would cobble together some kind of analytics to figure out what's going on. And all that was done with you know, modest means. Uh, today, the same analytics suite, which is being sold to uh, the world's largest forestry companies, uh, world-class analytics, real-time, comprehensive data, global, et cetera, you can access it, in essence, for free if you're using it for a non-commercial purpose. So that whole budget you had, not just of imagery, but of all the analytics and how to figure out how many trees were cut yesterday and in what part, you're now getting that as a, as a side benefit. That's just an initiative from Planet. That is, but I think, I think you see that when, when you see that kind, of, uh, that kind of progress in an industry, there tends to be, uh, es especially when the companies are run by fundamentally uh, good people who are, have kind of balanced views on these things, you tend to see that kind of side benefit also for non-commercial applications. And look, in the end, in space, uh, we haven't talked about the pitfalls. There are serious pitfalls in all this. Yeah, we're going to get and, to and, that soon. And every, every, every company in the world exists has a license to operate. And I think the people who operate in space are particularly sensitive to that, that they have to maintain their license, their societal license to operate, and therefore they have to be on balance good actors, right? And so they're paying a lot of attention to that. This is not intended at all. I think this is a counterexample of some new capability that is being hoarded by hedge funds in the world. Mm -hmm. They are good customers, by the way, but uh, that is not at all the intent nor the practice. I'd go even a state step further to say that the space industry is built on social purpose. I mean, you have an industry that is about the safety and security of nations. It's about radical transparency. It is about protecting the environment. It is about eradicating disease, about thwarting human trafficking. I mean, that is you know, helping smallholder farmers. That's at the very core and ballistic missiles. of this industry. Uh, and it's at the heart of the industry. And by putting that at the heart of the industry, it drives innovation. Uh, it, it has driven growth. And so I actually believe that, that purpose and societal benefits aren't a byproduct of this industry, but are actually a driving force at the foundation of this industry, both for governmental organizations and for commercial organizations. Okay, so it sounds so good. There's so many good things coming, and there's money here. There's so much money. You see, there's too much money. What are what are the pitfalls, and what are the constraints? Do you want to? I think if as long as it's not a big success, we have less problems. Yeah. Today it too will be too much good. Is uh, like Facebook is. At the, no, yeah. no, no, no. But for the moment, the space resources is for a lot of people uh, science fiction. And the day it will be reality, then the problem will start. Because other countries will say, it's not yours, it's not here, it's not there, it's not sure, it's not. And then they will restart the discussion. So as long as it's science fiction for some countries, it's OK that we do it. But as soon as we'll be successful, some trouble A will start. A lot of fighting will start, yeah. As long as you're not successful in some topics, people don't watch you. OK, well, but maybe they're not listening, successful. maybe, today. Well, no, but they are welcome to join our uh, initiative. Yeah, no, I'd say I mentioned the number of countries, right? So year, uh, decades ago, we have the Space Act. At the time it was written, there was only a few countries operating in space. When you look at doing 70, going in more countries, that pol those policies have to be re revised and how are you going to operate in space, especially near Earth, where you're going to have a lot more satellites, a lot more assets that be going out, and then how do you enable that exploration, moon, Mars, uh, you know, as we move out, we're going to have to have some policies and how we interact. Some rules of the road. The rules of the road. Yeah. And, that, and well, thing the, the the fledging, you know, aircraft industry, airline industry years ago, right? First started flying, there's no one around. It gets crowded. You have to have <laughs> rules of the road. You have to have methods to manage the traffic. And and that that is what a lot of government organizations are thinking about right now. With this rocket lab thing this weekend, where they. Uh, launch these small satellites. Uh, the the f guy said our biggest problem is keeping up with the demand. That was interesting. Um, that's a good problem to have. What are the other problems? Well, uh, cer certainly I think uh, 
when we think about policy and the rules of the road, I think about space debris and I think about orbital sustainability. Uh, the more satellites that are launched, the more risk there is of collision. If there's a collision, when there is a collision, there have been a few, uh, satellites break up and all it takes is something the size of a paint chip to take out a satellite. And so we need rules of the road, especially as more satellites are being launched. The, uh, the, the World Economic Forum and the Global Future Council on Space has taken this up and is pursuing the development of a space sustainability index in order to help address that. Uh, I think another big risk in this uh, field is it is intoxicating, right? The, the, this is the stuff dreams are made of. And so capital f flows into investment opportunities that actually aren't great investment opportunities. And that is actually bad for the industry. It's bad for investors. Uh, I, I worry about a large f uh, failure of a visible space company having a cascading effect because too much capital went after the dream. They have to still stay focused on the economics, and there are real economics to contend with in this industry. I'm going to agree on the first point, maybe not on the second, but uh, the, the space debris issue is, is really, really big deal. You know, space has all the advantages of not having atmosphere, but it means you can't dissipate energy, you can't dissipate heat easily, and you can't get rid of junk. Uh, so that's, that's going to turn out to be an enormous bottleneck. If I may, um, I'm less certain that there's lots of companies getting funded that, um, that have no business plan because uh, the, the new space companies are, in the end, relatively modest sums getting funded. It's not, it's not like this is a bubble where you know, tens of billions are flowing into it. And the few companies that are well-funded, I think, are well-funded for, for good reasons. We haven't talked about human beings yet, uh, and I think this would, would be a miss. One area, you know, human beings always fail to imagine how bad things can get and also fail to imagine how much they can change the positive. I think one of the reasons you're seeing so much interest, whether it's Elon Musk or the Mars ideas, it's also that I think people are waking up to the fact that we are going to access space as human beings soon and much sooner than maybe we thought 10, 20, 30 years ago. That is, uh, and primarily because of cost, uh, but also because the proliferation of private industry means that there's less control and therefore uh, people can actually express their desire to go to space more easily through, through more options, right? And, uh, and that is really, uh, if you ask me uh, what is the biggest business plan, it's not all the things we just talked about or even things like telecom, which is you know, a trillion dollar industry today in revenues. It's actually people going to space. And that seems still today a little fanciful uh, but the demand for that is absolutely enormous. And uh, people just can't, I mean, people are willing to risk still, because it's still a dangerous thing to even consider. And despite that, there is absolutely insatiable demand to get to space. Yes, in the baby way of just shooting yourself up and falling right back down. Uh, in the orbital way, in the near-Earth orbital way, the way that uh, a few people use space advantage to get on the space station but also to deep space. And people are signing actual contracts today because they want to go into deep space. And uh, there is going to be no holding that back. I mean, I know it sounds, you know, numbers sometimes we don't connect with. A hundredfold decrease in cost is not 10% or 90%, yeah, it's 99%. Yeah. This, is, this is not a small lever, right? This is a giant lever. And with that, you also get the benefits of reliability and safety. That business side, the economic side, is uh, really pretty, uh, pretty astounding. That's why I think that the point that was just made on, on space debris is likely to end up be a big bottleneck. So I think one of the things that will, will uh, 10 years from now, will be slowing down uh, the amount of people uh, that are going to space will be how to do that safely because of all the debris out there and what do we do about that. So that's going to be a, a big, big issue. How, is, I, how many years until you think it's going to be like regular people are going into space? So, so again, I think there's uh, flying up to 300,000 feet and dropping back down. There's being in orbit. And then there's you know, going to the moon or going to Mars or going to 
uh, a moon of Jupiter, right? There's different variations of that. Uh, but, uh, but certainly it's, uh, I'd look, it's hard to make, I should make a, I should probably give you a number, but then, you know, I'll regret it. So way sooner. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it. Way sooner than you think. No, just I, I have no idea what, yeah. what Just what to share a different perspective. Talk. I'm not the expert on how soon it's going to happen for the first time, but there will be examples. But since Ian was going to present a counterpoint, I'll present another, yes. which is flying to space for as far as the eye can see will be a very capital intensive endeavor. And capital intensive industries tend to struggle at times and are, can be cyclical. So take, for example, the airline industry, which you cover, uh, you know, has had some really tough times. Why do we believe that space tourism will be a more profitable industry than that? Uh, I believe that there will be examples and we will see people fly to space, but it will be, for better or worse, that will be for the few yeah. who have a lot of money and a high risk tolerance. Okay. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Declare, Greg Hendrick, I'm with XL Catlin, one of the larger space insurers uh, on this world. Um, <laughs> just curious, you mentioned sp insurance in the, in, in the beginning being an impediment. You mentioned 99% reduction in costs. What's the future need for insurance? Is it still an important function in how you all think about how you invest? or, or what, what next opportunity you go at? For the moment, the question of insurance is, is uh, the states, uh, the, the flag on the satellite is, uh, is responsible for, for, for problems. So uh, uh, I know that, uh, and in Luxembourg, for example, we are our own insurance, the state. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, for, for companies and others, there will still be big markets for future as uh, I, 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 I'm sure there will be opportunities to, to insurances and maybe for his search. I, I won't open a travel uh, a space agency in Luxembourg now, but maybe uh, also uh, yeah. maybe the travelers <laughs> want also an insurance <laughs> with, well, with well, the, for, for, for cancellation and everything. No, <laughs> joke by side, but I think there is an opportunity. But for the moment, you, you, some people ask me, why did you start this initiative also in Luxembourg? It's also because we, I want to move on that topic. The fact is we are speaking since years and years and years and years. And you need someone really, we have Space Act and now we have also this initiative from Luxembourg where we want really to move on. And before when I I'm, was a bit teasing by saying that if we are successful, other countries will see problems. We are speaking and speaking, but we are not moving on that topic. And there is a huge potential. And I'm happy if we are able to, to do that everybody now is at least speaking. I tell you last year we were five or ten persons in the, 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 um, the audience. Now we are 50. And so that shows that the interest is growing. And this is what we really wanted as a country also. And maybe there will be huge potential with insurances too. Yeah. And if you look a location for your insurance companies in Luxembourg, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Get a good yeah. tax rate. I, I would say, I don't, you know, Jeff said it right, the capital intensity here, I don't see insurance going away anytime soon. Maybe if you get enough uh, volume of traffic, it might change your, you know, the how you apply it or something. But well, so, you know, I, I seem to be trying to be the counterpoint. To everyone here. Great. So, so look, I, I think, uh, and this has nothing to do with my opinions. The the traditional model of there being, uh, you know, five launch providers, most of the business being GTO, and most satellites being multi hundred million, that is going away. Uh, will there be insurance? Of course, there's insurance in every business practically in the planet, but it will be a different different business model than what you're seeing today. A lot of questions. Let's start here, please. Um, Abdul Mohsen uh, Hosseini um, from a new space company called Analytical Space. I, too, work for Pete Warden. Uh, my question for you is there really hasn't been any major exit from any of the new space companies. Uh, some of them have been around for a while. You mentioned Planet. Uh, what, as an investor, how do you see, uh, what's your outlook for, uh, and, and uh, the fact that there hasn't been any exit, is it going to affect the investment climate in this uh, sector for the years to come? Well, there have been, uh, certainly in the history of space companies, there have been many exits. I think you're, you're probably referring to new space. Uh, as you know, the two big, uh, where the two companies are spending a lot of money on lift um, for the bigger rockets uh, are both uh, funded in a way that they're not seeking a public exit in the near, in the near future. That's just 
a fluke of how those two companies are set up. There's nothing fundamental. As a venture capitalist, you know, we try to do things in 10 to 14 year time frames. Uh, Planet uh, was literally started, and it's the only company we funded that was literally funded in a Palo Alto garage. Uh, and that was, I think, six years ago, if I'm counting correctly. Maybe it was seven, but it was in that time frame. So we're not, we're nowhere, even, even within the venture industry, there's nothing special on that front. And uh, many other companies uh, uh, that maybe are not in the new space have, have certainly transacted. So I, I don't see anything special there going on. Maybe somebody has a different answer, but... Uh, Let's go to this question here. Go ahead. Hi, Jamie Morin uh, with the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at Aerospace. I would ask the panelists if uh, each of you could maybe offer an example of where you see current policy, either uh, domestic policy, domestic space policy in individual countries or international space policy being most incongruent with where the technology and the economics of space is taking us. I'm happy to start. Uh, I think uh, Rick uh, talked about the Land Remote Sensing Act in the United States. It's 25 years old. It desperately needs to be modernized. So that would be point number one on, on my list. Okay, anyone else? In order, sure. I think, uh, look, I could, I could nitpick on a few things, but fundamentally, um, and this is not just in space, but across the board, uh, I think, unlike many other venture capitalists, we we uh, we seek we seek the role of government, seek the role of regulation, and I think on balance in space, it's in a good place. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Or? Well, just my earlier comment. You know, as you get more more uh, folks uh, going into space, playing, we mentioned the concern with debris. Well, today everyone you know are good actors because they understand uh, what happens with debris, as mentioned before. I do think there's going to be some policies and or rules of the road to the future because we'll stumble into something we didn't anticipate and then you don't recover from that for a very long time. I think you need treaties and you will need also uh, regulations. We will need it. But to arrive there, you need pioneers and pioneer spirit to push people mm -hmm. to realize that we will need it because for the moment, as I told you, for a lot of countries, it's still science fiction. Yeah. And so as long as it's science fiction, they think we don't need to speak about it. And so we, we need to push the topic on together with the private sector to show that it's not only da 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 it's real. Specifically on the resources side. For example, but it, it, the, the resources side is some, something where I'm sure as long as it's not successful, nobody takes care. But as uh, soon if, as if I may, as you know, uh, uh, Luxembourg has played a leading role in volunteering regulation that might take many more years to develop in other countries, but by being small and nimble, they've been able to sort of draft it, put it out there, make it functional, and then you know kind of let the process take it on from there. So I think that's a useful role. Look, we haven't. There's other pitfalls, right? Uh, certainly in terms of earth monitoring, uh, we we do need new and better regulation on maintaining that balance between good data and good analytics and, and, and uh, bad uses of those same analytics in terms of privacy, military, uh, you know, uh, satellite data has been used to target refugees in Syria. I mean, there's, it's not hard to find bad things that right. occur, right? Look, the other piece that is obviously very worrisome is, uh, you know, public is justifiably concerned about, I mean, we are all justifiably concerned about uh, ballistic missiles from North Korea. And let's face it, in the last 10 years, the ability to send within 20 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, a payload from anywhere on the planet to anywhere on the planet has now become socialized. And um, that's, that's a big problem, right? So, so another thing to, that where governments are behind in, in addressing that. Other questions here in the front? Paul Jacobs from Qualcomm. Um, I wanna push a little harder on some of the things that you guys have said because I actually feel like the trends are pushing us to the place where we're gonna to be too successful in the space industry to, to go after what you said. More plentiful launch, smaller satellites from sort of less professional organizations is gonna exacerbate space debris badly, or badly. And we could get to the point where it destroys the whole industry in, in a certain way. And then you talk about big epic failures of things that are very visible. 
And I don't, I don't think that many people are going to go to space. And that's the thing that captures everybody's attention. I mean, you're going to get launched on a rocket at very high G. All of a sudden, the rocket turns off. You barf, you know, because <laughs> your body's not used to that. And, uh, and you're up there for a little while. And, and even today, you can go on a zero G plane for a few grand. And not that many people even do that. So I just question whether these trends are sort of pushing us towards a brick wall. And will we actually be more limited by these regulatory issues that we all have to band-aid to solve the problem than these really cool technological trends that are heading towards what looks like should be you know, nirvana, but actually won't turn out to be because we can't quite get there. Paul, I, I, I agree. Too negative? With, I, no, I, I agree. Well, I agree with much of what you said. Uh, I couldn't possibly argue with it. I, I share a similar view. I also believe that there are responsible space operators. There are real customer needs, uh, whether it's and and I and so I'm an optimist uh, that I'm I'm seeing developments that will lead to continued growth. We just need to be aware that there will be pitfalls. That it isn't all uh, you know. It, there are risks. And smart investors will make smart decisions, and good operators will make good decisions, and government, I believe, also will eventually get the regulatory question right. Why do you speak about good investors, good uh, sciences, and not good governments? I said good governments. <laughs> I said good governments. I said good governments. Yeah. But, but, Absolutely. Okay. Well, you know, Jeff earlier was talking about some of the uh, economic risks, uh, but that's a concern. You know, every time we launch, you know, it's a significant event. The, the the criticality of the mission that we're putting up, you know, putting up uh, for NOAA a uh, you know, next generation weather satellite that protects lives of uh, you know everyone in the U.S. and partnership with other countries. Um, you know, that's serious. And what we worry about, if you don't have that rigor, and someone rushes too fast, you've been you know I think it's exactly what you're poking at. Are you taking, you know, are you burning down that risk to really understand you have the right design and things? And you know, there's some, you know, very good companies that are doing it today, but it's all the, you know, we talked, you know, 975 startups. Now, a lot of those are doing um, uh, component level or things that they might add to a satellite or, or something else, but that, that's a worry, B. That's why I don't think the insurance industry is going to morph any time quickly. I do think of the business model will shift over time if you're doing it more. So, so I just want to correct one thing that, if I may, uh, the new space companies, these hundreds of companies that are doing typically CubeSat type, they're making no contribution to space junk. They're all flying way too low for that. So that big uh, entrepreneurial, inexpensive activity has not been a problem, will not be a problem for space. Now, Okay, so I was about to say, yes, so there's three or four companies now, or, or three or four groups of companies that are looking to put up beefier uh, mid-altitude constellations. There's no evidence that those companies are less professional uh, than the incumbents. So I was just, and, and we're talking a few companies, so I just didn't want to conflate incredibly fun, exciting entrepreneurial activity from hundreds of companies that are in low earth that have no contribution to space junk. With that, that's, that's not true though. That's not true. Low, uh, satellites that are in low earth orbit are still contributing to risk of collision. And especially when they do not have propulsion and there aren't teams of people on the ground who are monitoring them, taking in the data and moving them when they're at risk of collision. So. Uh, it's an issue. It needs to be addressed. Fortunately, there are government policymakers and there are industry participants who are working really hard. And the World Economic Forum is one of those multi stakeholder organizations that are trying to get in front of this issue. We have to get in front of it. And, and we didn't even talk about somebody blowing up another satellite, which is going to really cause a lot of problems. So, what's going to happen? I mean, well, it's the space, same. Space yeah. Is such an issue. Yeah. I mean, no with autonomous cars, like, has a huge amount of potential, but probably some people will get hurt along the way, right? I mean, so it's sort of similar. Yeah. Hi, I'm Matt Grab. Uh, I'm Matt Grab, also from Qualcomm, and I, I just wanted to ask the panel, um, with respect to the launcher business, in the in the next ten years, do you foresee any potential to get past uh, chemical rockets for launchers? 
And is that necessary to get the 99x, 99% or 100-fold reduction? Um, you see any potential? Or are we just going to keep incrementally improving those chemical rockets forever? I, I don't mean to overstate my time budget, but I may be the only one interested in that question, so I'll answer it. <laughs> um, look, the, the current rocket engines are, you know, by pound by pound, the most power-dense engines in the world, right, in, in that we have. So there's nothing that comes close. And, uh, and even if there were, then you'd also have to bring fuel on board in a way that was competitive with the fuel density of having, even when you're bringing your oxygen with you. So we're nowhere near having an alternative to a chemical rocket engine. Um, the only, the, uh, for lift, we're talking for lift, we're not talking for once you're in space. Um, look, I, I don't think it's crazy to think about that, uh, but, but you, you, you have to look at uh, the potential of having fusion power and, uh, and an electromagnetic engine. Uh, that feels like complete science fiction today. I don't think it's science fiction, but it's certainly not uh, in our current venture fund, right? So it's not a crazy thought, but it's, not, it's nothing immediate. Again, you need, you need a way to store that energy, and then you need an engine, and both of those things have to be competitive with rockets. And that's, we're still order of magnitude away from that. Okay, I have a very little time. One last quick question over here. To, to the Prime Minister's science fiction concern uh, on space resources, uh, the, the House passed, uh, the U.S. House passed the Space Act last year that clearly said whoever goes and gets it keeps it. Um, and so there was stuff about there's one asteroid Let's with bring more it to your question because they're going to cut, cut us off. How do we reconcile that with the rest of the world? I don't know if we got the question. I don't know if we got the question. <laughs> I don't think I got the question. All right, maybe we'll have to do that one after class. I'm sorry because they're 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 telling me we've got to wrap. But I will say, um, this has been an honor. It's a really really interesting area. We've got a a really smart panel and audience, and I've learned a lot, and I thank you all. So thank you for yeah. being here. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>